All right, welcome everyone. My name is Ellen Mueller. I'm the director of the MFA program at Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And I wanted to start today, um, before I introduce our speakers in our event, with respectfully acknowledging that the land we are occupying in Minneapolis is unceded territory, the ancestral homelands of the Dakota people. Gathering here, we pay our respects to the elders, both past and present. We acknowledge the grave harm that colonialism brought to these lands, in particular, the erasure of both indigenous, indigenous and African identities, not only under slavery, but via racist laws that segregated all people into binary classifications of white and black. We honor those who have lived and who do live now at the intersections of identity and experience. So wherever you are joining us from tonight, uh, whether it's the Twin Cities, greater Minnesota or beyond, I would like to conclude this acknowledgement with a participatory activity. I witnessed this at the recent Common Field convening, and uh, this is a great way to illustrate the breadth of lands that we occupy and steward. Please type into the chat which lands you are currently occupying. And if you're not aware, please find a starting point through hashtag honor native land resources from the US Department of Arts and Culture, as well as the native land digital map. So feel free to watch the chat um, as these uh, are entered in and we can see the diverse areas that people are coming from. Um, and feel free to use that map link. We'll let this run for a minute or so as we observe. Oh, and I should clarify, I'm seeing a lot of folks post into the questions area. It's a wonderful list. Um, we'll use the chat area to post all of these. Um, and then in the questions, we'll specifically collect questions for our panelists at the end. Oh, and I'm getting a message that folks can't type into the chat. Thank you for that feedback. We'll have Seth look into that. And for now, we'll go ahead and move on. And once the chat is open, um, we'll make sure that folks can type into there. Um, so feel free to, to keep tabs on the chat as we move along. And I will, um, I'll keep going here. So I'm gonna move along in our slides. And just to let you all know, audio and video is muted for this webinar. Um, and we're, as I, I just mentioned, the chat in the question area, we'll just enter questions into that question area. Um, and then at the end, after all of our six presenters have presented this evening, I will be selecting questions out of the question area and we'll feed those to the panelists to answer and develop conversation. Um, a recording of this webinar will be made available after the event. And the full agenda for the conference can be found at this link if you haven't already visited there. Also, we have a handout available for download in the navigation column. And if you experience any technical difficulties, please feel free to email us at the email address listed there. And this event is sponsored by the MCAT MFA program. We've got more information about the MFA program at this link here, mcad-mfa.com. Also, I wanted to promote this fantastic event. When we were originally planning this event, we were going to have a whole Sunday devoted to learning from place Vidote. And um, with COVID, things moved in a different direction, but these are really great tours. And uh, I just heard today that they both filled. Um, so if you're in the Twin Cities area and you'd like to be on their wait list, um, feel free to email them, sign up, uh, and enjoy this really rich experience that is available in the Twin Cities area. So also, I want to make sure to call out and um, to thank and acknowledge the labor of our wonderful um, technical support and our administrative support. An event like this would not be possible without a whole bunch of hands on deck. Um, so thank you to Kylie Van Note, Seth Dalseed, uh, Cleo Young, 
and Lauren Zimich and Nikki Modicolum, all of them were great um, in assisting getting this event off the ground. So um, I'm gonna jump in and introduce a little bit more about the event and we'll go right up to our speakers. So um, it's such a pleasure to gather with all of you, uh, especially after all of our rescheduling. So thank you for your patience. If you've been following along with this event for um, since March when we originally started planning, uh, the idea for this conference came from recognition that many programs in higher education are moving towards increasing community engagement and experiential learning um, with very place-based themes. And as time passed this spring, we've seen the idea of place highlighted um, as we live through a pandemic, as we grapple with civil unrest following the murder of George Floyd and too many others at the hands of the police, and also um, with the recent regulations passed by ICE um, affecting our international students, which I'm pleased to say today were reversed. So um, in every way, we see the idea of place intersecting with our daily lives. Um, so this felt like a really uh, important topic to delve into and discover more um, deeply and more in a detailed manner. So today, um, I'm excited that we're gonna be hearing from a variety of viewpoints, from artists to educators to curators, um, and I hope that everyone will find something useful in our presenters' talks this evening, which will be followed by Q&A. So I'd like to start off with a little poll, just so we can all learn a, a little bit more about who's present in this webinar. So um, I'd like to ask, what area of art or education do you work in or participate in? So Seth is gonna put the poll on the screen and we're going to um, take maybe 30 seconds to answer that poll question. And I think that's getting launched. There it is. So take a moment and um, go ahead and check which one applies to you. We'll leave that for about 30 seconds, give everybody a chance to enter. And we've got about 90% of people have voted. We'll wait a couple more seconds. We're nearly there, just a few people left. All right. And then Seth, if you wanna share the results of that poll. Excellent, so it's looking like about 8% are coming from K through 12. We've got 84% coming from higher ed college, 24% um, coming from the community-based or nonprofit world, and then 11% from other places, which is really great. So we get a sense of who is in this virtual room with us. So without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Sanjeet Seth, Sethi, he, him pronouns, president of Minneapolis College of Art and Design. I'll hand it over to Sanjeet. Uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, I appreciate this and uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to um, talk with all of you um, and uh, and I really do um, first and foremost uh, just want to start off by uh, recognizing the hard work that Ellen and her team has done in putting a conference like this together um, and adapting it uh, to our current situation um, and uh, responding in a really generous and thoughtful fashion. Uh, conversations uh, like this do not occur overnight. And I just, um, I think for me, um, just the incredible degree of uh, thoughtfulness and care put into this is, is something that I think really reflects well on the MFA program at MCAD, but also more broadly on our ability to go ahead and try to understand what's going on and provide conversations and dialogues like this for the field. Um, so I'm really grateful for everyone that's able to listen this evening we're all balancing childcare and Zoom meetings and et cetera. And so um, um, it's tremendous to be able to take this time to be together. Um, uh, I think being a keynote speaker just means that I made my presentation in keynote. Um, I'm, I'm here to go ahead and posit a couple ideas um, and, and really listen uh, and hear what people have to say. So um, 
from my vantage point, MCAD is really about educating the next generation of cultural leaders. Uh, and I think more and more uh, we see now is a time where uh, we need cultural leadership um, in all aspects of our lives. Um, um, and, um, and we know that um, it really takes skillful practitioners and conversations and dialogues like this that allow us to think about uh, how do we go ahead and exemplify and articulate um, and drill into what cultural leadership really means. Uh, I've been in a process starting with our alumni of starting to ask them through, through a, um, a postcard uh, uh, um, initiative of what does cultural leadership mean to you. Um, and so um, despite the pandemic and maybe because of the pandemic, uh, we're getting incredibly thoughtful responses as to what that means to you. So I, I guess I'll also say that anyone that's participating um, in this conversation, if you um, if you want uh, me to send you a postcard for you to posit your thoughts about cultural leadership, I'm happy to You can get my email at the end of this presentation. Um, so I, I'm gonna spend time talking today about monuments and memorials. Um, um, uh, there's reasons why monuments and memorials certainly now uh, are coming into our current dialogue, uh, though they've been swirling and surrounding us for years, uh, whether it's uh, monuments that have existed in places like Boston or Memphis, Tennessee, um, um, or um, uh, conversations about whose monument where and why and what does it commemorate. Uh, but certainly since the murder of George Floyd, um, we have seen a renewed attention and focus, rightfully so, on the role that monuments and memorials play within our society. Um, um, particularly, I'm interested in this conversation about talking about uh, monuments and memorials that have unseen, hidden, and overlooked qualities to them. Um, I'm particularly taken by this quote by James E. Young uh, in his book, The Texture of Memory, which was published in 1993. It says events that occurred in another time seemed increasingly to belong to another world altogether. Only a deliberate act of memory could reconnect them, reinfuse the sites with a sense of their historical past. And in particular, uh, I'm really interested in this idea of deliberate act of memory uh, and how that's reflected on where we are now. Um, our notions uh, of monuments and memorials have really evolved over time. Uh, here's a non-chronological evolution, but this is the World War II memorial, uh, you know, full of fountains and the um, uh, wreaths um, uh, in the uh, kind of plaza and um, dramatic uh, effects. The evening lighting is um, highly dramatic. Um, and we've seen that in some ways kind of typifies uh, a monuments that are really built by the state for the state uh, to commemorate sacrifice, but to do it with a sense of grandeur. Um, and then um, from an overhead view, you still see that. Again, um, the, the breath, it's a, I was talking to a colleague of mine, it's a, it's a memorial that really mansplains quite a bit. Um, and it really um, has that tendency to want to go ahead and occupy volume um, and uh, in, and surround you at a certain level. Uh, and you compare that with Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial, um, where those individuals uh, that have lost people come there to find their names on these uh, uh, stone slabs. Uh, and the monument itself, the memorial itself exists as a, as a minute scar uh, on the mall, um, very different than the World War II Memorial. And you think of that in relationship um, to this memorial, um, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, uh, done by a uh, mass design group, um, is, uh, uh, supported by the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, um, uh, where you see that, um, that association with research uh, done to talk about um, these uh, 805 hanging steel rectangles that are roughly in coffin shape um, and are representing the, um, the lynchings that have occurred in 805 different counties uh, in the United States. Um, and there um, you feel that weight above you uh, and around you uh, and you're surrounded by it. Um, the shift here is uh, here is a memorial that is really uh, in great part, um, um, commemorating and understanding and trying to reconcile 
violence that is actually the, the, where the state itself was complicit in. Uh, and I think that that's a pretty phenomenal transformation. Uh, if you know me, you know that I like a lot of questions, and I believe that's what, what drives things. There's uh, a couple questions in particular that I find myself focusing on right now, and I wonder if there are similar questions that many of you have or, or other questions. Uh, one for me is, and I think in, in thinking about um, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, is how can monuments go beyond edifying the state? Um, uh, another question that I have is how do temporal or virtual memorials create viable alternatives for the remembrance of a past or at times a current trauma? Um, yet another question I have, uh, and in some ways the basis for the rest of this conversation is how can existing monuments be repurposed and used as a platform to address traumas that have been uh, hidden, unseen, or overlooked? Uh, how can we look at sites of memory uh, through that James E. Young quote and this active process of remembrance? So um, I I'm gonna spend a, I've got a one example for each uh, with the belief that brevity is supposed to be rewarded. Um, and so, uh, with Hidden, I'm, I'm going to talk uh, about um, a project that the artist Joachim de Gertz uh, did in 1993 um, called uh, 2,146 Stones, a uh, Monument Against Racism uh, in Saarbrücken, Germany. Um, Joachim Gertz worked um, uh, with students from, uh, and maybe I, I tend to gravitate to projects that also have had um, students involved uh, from the Saar College of Visual Arts uh, on a three-year project um, where uh, um, they took this uh, central uh, plaza in front of the Saarbrücken Palace, the seat of the regional government, um, and they did research on all the um, different, um, all the over 2000, the 2,146 Jewish cemeteries that existed in Germany before World War II started. Uh, and what they did uh, was dug up uh, every single one of those central field stones they see uh, covertly, brought them back to a workshop, and engraved the names um, of each one of those cemeteries, and then slipped them back in uh, without public officials knowing. So they did this over a three-year process, at times disguised as municipal workers. Uh, um, um, and so what you saw here um, was um, that this site was then infused non-visibly um, uh, in a hidden, silent format um, of all the names of these Jewish cemeteries, many of which were destroyed by the, the Nazis during World War II. Um, so here's the, um, here's the plaza in front of the Saarbrücken Palace. Um, and it was only when the actual project was done in all 2,146 stones that were engraved with the names of the cemeteries were re-embedded back uh, in here. Did they go ahead and um, talk to public officials and go ahead and say that this is what they've done? Um, uh, and so since then, the square has been renamed the Square of the Invisible Monument. Um, there's something about the palpable nature of how this space is suffused with uh, the recognitions of these individual cemeteries, again, many of which that, um, did, not survive, uh, uh, did not survive Nazi Germany. So I'm gonna talk next about unseen uh, as a quality too. Um, and here I'm gonna use a, a project that I did back in 2007 uh, in Memphis, Tennessee called the Kuniwada Bakery Remembrance. Um, um, as I um, was doing research in Memphis, Tennessee, um, I came, I was looking for, um, uh, and it's oftentimes the case, I was looking for something else as I was doing uh, archival research and saw this article that was uh, published in the Memphis Commercial Appeal two days after Pearl Harbor. Um, uh, and what you'll notice is, is that um, uh, in the lower right-hand corner is an article about, and, and again, uh, using uh, the crew titled Jap Bakery Guard, uh, Guards, it, it talked about a Japanese bakery. Um, and I think I can get closer to this. Uh, and this is a Japanese uh, bakery uh, that existed in downtown Memphis that was owned by two families, the Nakajimas and the Kawais, um, and how um, two days after uh, Pearl Harbor and a fit of xenophobic uh, convulsions that had gripped the city, they shut down this bakery. Um, they imprisoned the male uh, senior members of the families. 
um, um, uh, and they were picked up by the FBI as they were considered dangerous aliens. Um, the bakery, um, the bakery was then um, uh, seized uh, by uh, 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 by the Federal Reserve Bank uh, and was no more. And I was really interested in about this lost bakery uh, and what it said about a community's reaction. So part of it was to find out really where the bakery was. Um, and if you uh, can see down at about the center of the screen, there are three small stacks. Um, but it didn't exist officially in the property lines anymore. And so with further research, you realize that uh, it was the site of a tool and die repair company. Uh, the question is, is that how do you uh, remember uh, a bakery, which in many ways is the heart of a community? Um, uh, I did this in part through looking at lots of research, you know, archival research, as well as talking with uh, survivors of Japanese internment, um, uh, adv advocacy groups, um, but also individuals in that community that remembered that bakery. So I took out um, ads in the Commercial Appeal. I worked with the Japanese American Cultural League um, uh, and spoke to octogenarians at the time um, that had really remembered the bakery. And what I often got was um, I was off, I went off to World War II, I came back and I immediately headed for this bakery and then I forgot that they shut it down. So uh, the goal here was to go ahead and see how do you uh, how do you reminisce on people that really remembered their uh, cinnamon fried cakes and their uh, their sticky buns? Uh, and how do you feel like that that's something palpable that you recognize? So during the time that the installation was up, um, every morning and every early evening, if you walked by that site, uh, you smelt the smell of freshly baked uh, 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 um, fried cakes and uh, cinnamon fried cakes and sticky buns. And if you followed your nose, he followed it to this unit that was emitting the scent and there was a plaque honoring the Nakajimas and the Kawais. Uh, but the goal was to use olfactory systems as a form uh, of reminiscence and to think about smells association with memory. Uh, so there's the box on the left uh, that you see right across from the tool and dye company that people could go ahead and go in uh, and experience that. Um, but again, thinking about this notion of, uh, of what it means um, to go ahead and um, connect with memory without really the focus being on a physical object itself. So lastly, I'm gonna talk about the notion of overlooked. Um, and with overlooked, um, uh, I'm interested in both the kind of, um, the way we go ahead and frame the obvious and, uh, and not so obvious. Um, the, um, uh, the artist collaborative group, uh, Kate Erickson and Mel Ziegler uh, did a project as part of the Spoleto Arts Festival in Charleston, South Carolina in 1991 called Camouflaged History. Part of what they like to do was to work uh, collaboratively. They like to work with um, different elements um, of individuals. Um, and what they did was they took, um, <clears throat> um, they, uh, they took a, a row house that they were able to go ahead and utilize the outside. Um, it's it was just on the other side um, of the historical neighborhood with a very set uh, set of standards, and among their set standards were um, what the paint colors that residents could use to paint their house. And they worked with a local, uh, they looked with a local camouflage um, department of a U.S. Army base to come up using those historical paint colors to come up with uh, the camouflage pattern for um, for this paint um, um, uh, um, for um, for this house itself. And so what you got was in some ways a garish. Um, uh, uh, object here that a uh, paint uh, scheme for this house that certainly did anything uh, but blend in. But what it did was it became an icon for talking about the encroachment of gentrification, but it also became a tableau for how um, the South's racial history and their racialized history was still deeply embedded and accepted in many walks of life, including in paint colors. Um, and so you can see the white text that's on top of the little splotches of paint. And if you look closely, um, what they are is that they, um, they were the names of the different paint colors the historical district used, including Fort Sumter, Deep Stone, Upcountry Sandstone, um, Confederate Uniform Gray. Uh, and the one that's, that never shows up, and I'm sorry the image isn't here um, because the contrast is too, too weak, is Plantation White. Uh, and you think about it where we are as a point in time now. So um, uh, um, with that in mind, um, it's interesting to know this, once this project was done, the house was repainted. And when I was in Charleston a few years ago, I, 
I had to go back and see if I could find the house. Uh, and this is the house now. And what I think is remarkable is embedded within this house, which is now part of a broader gentrified community, um, is this history of this project called Camouflage History. Uh, and again, uh, a little bit similar to Jochen Gertz, but it, it exists um, uh, in some way, shape or form. Uh, but I think it was really telling to talk about the dialogues that was, were had then, but also how insufficient some of those dialogues were considering where we are now. So speaking of where we are now, um, we certainly see um, uh, uh, an immediate and visceral response to the way we're looking at monuments and memorials. Um, uh, uh, whether it's the um, removal um, by uh, activists that say it's absolutely reprehensible for us to have these monuments or memorials uh, within our midst that glorify racism, that glorify a past of oppression um, and a past um, um, that really um, um, uh, ascribes and celebrates the systematic genocide of people, um, or whether it's the state taking things into their own hands. Um, and more carefully removing these objects. Um, but it lends itself for us to wonder, um, what do we do now? Um, uh, I think it's beyond thinking about the removal of these objects, but it's also what goes in its place. Uh, what are the dialogues and conversations that we need? Uh, one of my hats is as a curator. Um, and one of the things that, uh, one of the projects, the curator the curatorial projects I'm working on was, um, since this past fall has been um, an invitational project to ask people, uh, to ask a series of artists and designers um, to go ahead and, and think about what they would do um, um, if they could modify or change any existing monument or memorial. And since I have you all as a captive audience, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing and hopefully we fix the, the, the bugs with the, um, uh, the chat box here. Um, but you know, what I'd like you to do is think of a monument. Um, uh, it could be a monument that you visited. It could be a monument around your corner of your house. Um, uh, but just think of a monument and feel free to post it in the chat box. And, um, and as your, um, as you're doing that, um, the next question I have for all of you is to be able to go ahead and when you tell us what it is, is if you could um, modify it in any way, um, smelt down the statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest and make it, them into bowls for people that are homeless, uh, what would it be? What would you do with it? Uh, would you grind it to dust? Would you go ahead and um, what would you do? And um, and I think that for me, in some ways, uh, these two questions are at the cusp of where we are now. Uh, I think the dialogue needs to go beyond removal. It needs to go into a territory of talking about how do we create that active terrain uh, of memory uh, and how do we go ahead and think about what's an active form of remembrance. Uh, and so lastly, um, 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 I, it's worth asking you as you propose um, what you think you could do with these monuments, but to also ask why. Um, so with that, uh, I hope to continue conversations uh, with many of you in the future. And again, I'm, I'm good for sending you a postcard uh, asking you what your thoughts about cultural leadership are uh, at my email address. Uh, so I wanna thank you and, and thank Ellen, um, uh, and I'm open to have questions, thanks. Thank you so much, Sanji. That was fantastic. Um, and also, folks, we are I'm, we can't really fix the chat right now, unfortunately. So we'll just pretend that the, the questions area is our chat. So feel free to post in that questions area with any any thoughts, responses for Sanji. And when we are finished with all uh, the remaining five presenters, we're going to go ahead and do a Q&A for everyone. So I'll keep an eye on that questions box. Um, next. We have Mary V. Bordeaux, Lakota, she, her, they, them pronouns, who will be presenting responsibilities and obligation, uh, <clears throat> obligations, understand Mitakue Oyasin.
forgot to unmute myself, sorry. Thanks, <laughs> Elaine. Um, thanks for uh, having me here today. Um, and like Elaine said, my name is Mary Bordeaux. I'm Sichangu, Lakota. Um, I'm from Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and I currently live in Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, I just want to say quickly, um, it was interesting the last Sanji, the last presenter about um, the monuments and because we're not, because um, we're a panelist or presenters, we can't chat with everybody or do the questions, but um, it would be interesting to look into Crazy Horse Memorial um, and the largest um, active sculpture uh, which is happening in the Black Hills right now, and that they allow visitors to take parts of this stone that are blasted away, um, away from with them uh, when visitors leave. Anyway, <laughs> something to think about. So, um, so I'm uh, going to be talking today. Um, of course, I you know I don't always follow the rules, so I change the name of <laughs> my um, presentation. So, Madaki um, Oyasin, Heckling Issues of Language, Culture, and the Complexities of Perspective. Um, and so today, you know, I'm just going to um, give an introduction to um, the other two curators and artists that were, and um, folks that we interviewed for this process, for this exhibition. Um, and then the conceptualizing of it, the, or the interview process, the conce conceptualizing of it, and then the um, just talking through the exhibition, uh, which I called the Inspired and Found. Um, so this exhibition um, was a collaborate, collaborative process with um, myself, um, Laylee Long Soldier, and Clementine Bordeaux. And Clementine is a doctoral student at the World Arts and Culture Dance Department at the University of California in Los Angeles. She works across um, multiple uh, disciplines and, inter and like an interdisciplinary field um, and collaborates with artists, culture bearers, and community activists. Um, she's also my sister. And then uh, Laylee Long Soldier, who received a BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts and MFA from Bard College. Um, she's the author of Whereas. Um, which was published in 2017. She won the 2018 Penn um, Jean Stein Book Award, um, and she was sh shortlisted for the National Book Award and has won many other um, literary awards. Um, but she's also a visual artist, and um, Laylee and I have known each other for quite some time and done a lot of collaborative work together. Um, when I worked at the Heritage Center at Red Cloud Indian School, we did a um, it was the beginning of her book, Whereas, um, and she was writing poetry for it, and we did an interactive exhibit about that, um, I think in like 2012, maybe, I can't remember. Um, so anyway, it was the three of us, and, you know, we were thinking about this, the use of the language, um, of the Lakota language by Lakota people and non-Lakota people, and specifically the statement of um, Madaku Oyasin, and that it can be, you know, we've seen it used in so many ways uh, when people, folks will use it as a way to um, uh, like end a, a presentation, um, kind of as an all inclusive statement. Um, while we were putting this exhibit together, um, in 2017, 2018, the um, police department here in Rapid City, South Dakota, actually put it on a with some um, pan Indian native imagery, um, put the statement Badaki Oyasin on the side of police cruisers um, as a way to show <laughs> inclusiveness, um, which is really problematic. But um, and so, you know, this exhibit was kind of a personal reflective process of how we, us three Lakota women, um, came to understand the phrase Madaku Oyasin, and um, that maybe it's not necessarily um, 
an all inclusive or it is an all inclusive statement, but it's not necessarily meant to be so used so flippant, um, like on the side of a police cruiser. So, um, and if Madakyo Oyasin, I guess I didn't say that, <laughs> translates to, um, is loosely translated to we, we are all related or we're all relatives. Um, so, and that's, and that's when it, like I said, folks use it at the end of a statement or a presentation, they'll say Madakyo Oyasin, you know, kind of tie everything together. Um, so this exhibit too, so then um, we met in 2016 um, to talk through this um, and you know at first we weren't sure exactly what the exhibition would be, um, what kind of you know we just we wanted to hear other perspectives and especially um, Lakota female perspectives. Um, generally uh, the, what's written about Historically, what's written about Lakota culture comes from a male perspective because, you know, generally it was male anthropologists coming and gathering information from the men of the Lakota people. Um, and so our, we decided to kind of focus on that um, female perspective that was missing um, about this idea of Madaki Oyasin or the concept of it and what does it mean. Um, and of course, we wanted to come from a, a community um, curation practice, I suppose, and um, making sure that we weren't trying to speak for all Lakota people and that we it, this is, you know, our kind of our journey and um, understanding with the help of other Lakota women. Um, and so the, you know, this is where the responsibility is an obligation, understanding what Daki Oyasin exhibition um, came about. And um, it first exhibited at um, Racing Magpie in Rapid City in 2017, and then it's traveled to a few places. And right now it's at the Plains Art Museum in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, so the interview process, we interviewed um, five Lakota women. Um, we developed four questions for um, to ask them during the process. And we had two video cameras and you know uh, audio recorder. But we asked just um, what did they know of the phrase? What does it mean to them? When was the first time they heard it? Um, and how do they understand um, how it's used? And uh, so we just use these four questions to guide the interviews. And the interviews vary with each um, participant um, from anywhere from like 45 minutes to three hours, depending on two, I think our relationship with them, a few of the people we had gone on, um, to school with or were um, extended relatives of ours. And my sister and I did the interview process. Um, Laylee was just part of helping to develop the questions. So these are the five women that we interviewed. Um, Dusty Nelson, she was a grade school language art teacher at the time when we interviewed her. Um, Jace DeCorey, she was a director of the American Indian Studies Department at Black Hill State University. Um, Agnes Peacock had done um, extensive research with Ella Deloria's text, um, and she is our aunt. And then Mabel Peacock, who's a principal um, at Takini School, um, and she is also our relative. And then Bai Wan, um, she worked for the Rosebud Sioux Tribe Education Department. Um, and is also a, a writer. Um, and so we met with, um, so we use these interviews to um, just ask these four questions, gain information and understanding about Madaki Oyasin. And then we would um, transcribe them and share, um, and then share the audio with Laylee. And so then um, from the interviews, we created all of the, um, the three of us created, um, kind of collaborative art pieces um, inspired by the 
uh, interviews from the artists. Um, so, and I just have to say, I have a short clip. Um, and Seth, who was super great, um, told us to send these clips in earlier so we could play them. But um, like I said, I tend to not listen sometimes. Um, and so I'm gonna try um, and to play just to show a little bit of this, um, a snippet from one of the interview process, one of the interviews um, and the audio clip that we decided to use for the exhibition. The universe wanted everybody to um, to be Lakota if we would have all been born Lakota. You know what I mean? But we, we're, di we're diverse. We're all diverse um, people from different backgrounds with our own traditions. And um, while it's okay to celebrate those differences, it's not okay to um, misappropriate and cross boundaries, sacred boundaries for your own benefit. So um, we used those, um, we would use audio clips like that one there. Um, specifically, um, I would take the information and um, listen and think about the things that the interviewer, interviewee was um, talking about and created three-dimensional pieces that then would hold their audio. So I created this um, kind of grasshopper, um, <laughs> cricket type thing. It's more of a grasshopper. <laughs> so um, created this three-dimensional grasshopper um, that has a speaker in it and you can hear Dusty, um, that audio clip that I just played. It's, a, you know, it's longer, it's like two minutes, but so this is playing inside of the grasshopper. And um, and then there's other audio clips from other interviews um, that relate to this grasshopper. Um, because some of the information that, or the, yeah, the information that we were getting from um, the Lakota women was that, you know, when we say we're all related or Madaku Oyasin, we're not just talking about, um, person to person or human to human. We're talking about human to non-human as well. So um, our relation, when we're saying we're all related, we're talking about our how we're related to um, grasshoppers or mosquitoes with something that all five of the um, <laughs> interview, um, the community members talked about was being related to mosquitoes, even though maybe we don't want to be related to them. Um, and, and so, you know, but that, you know, so you're, you're, and when you're related to something, you have a responsibility to it. And then when you have a responsibility, there's an obligation there. Um, so that's where, you know, we started to um, kind of work through those interviews. Um, and so we had this, these that the grasshopper, there's another one I'll show a little bit later that a porcupine that just had audio in them. Um, and then we also had these kind of floating three-dimensional pieces that had video. So the audio clip, um, similar to the one with Dusty, um, would will play on a small video screen inside of um, these. And so one is a buffalo skull. Um, it had the small, um, it's just like an iPad inside and then speakers so you could put your head, your head inside and then you kind of have this intimate experience um, listening to these Lakota women um, explain their understanding of Madaki Oyasin. Um, and then the buffalo skull was lined with sage, um, which also has some si significant meaning to Lakota people and um, many other um, indigenous tribes. Um, so, and then this was inside of the rock. That was the other floating piece. Um, which is lined with sweet grass and then the small screen and um, it had speakers and you would just um, put your head inside and then listen to what was being said to you. So um, we had uh, one participant who um, did not want to be videoed but was really open to audio recording um, and so we talked with her and she um, 
talked a lot about anger and um, and how um, anger um, can shape people and how you have to help them through that. Um, and so it inspired me to build um, this porcupine piece um, that has her audio in it. So, and again, I'll play a little bit of that and um, hopefully you can hear it. But um, this audio, um, yeah, I'll just move on <laughs> so you can listen. Sometimes this um, trauma we all lived through in the past really affects us today. And so we have to learn how to understand that it does affect us. And some of us who've moved away from it have to help the others who are still. So the hope with this piece was that um, we played the audio a little bit quieter. And so the whoever was um, the viewer had to kind of lean in to hear. Um, and we wanted to kind of get folks to feel a little bit uncomfortable with the porcupine quills. Um, I mean, they're not really going to hurt you. They're just uh, fabric. <laughs> but so just to lean in and have to listen um, and to listen what Bai was saying about trauma and um, anger. And then um, Bai also talks about um, intuition and the importance of intuition, um, especially as women. So and then um, so then this so then Laylee, um, she would listen to these, help us decide about the three dimensional pieces. And then because Laylee, of course, is a poet, um, she and a visual artist, she created these visual poems of um, star quilts. And um, historically, Lakota people would um, have buffalo robes and um, paint on them to tell stories and um, pass information along <clears throat> between families and to honor each other. Um, and then, of course, with um, colonization and um, introduction of new materials that kind of moved into this, to the use of the star quilt and um, fabric blanket. Um, and so Laylee created these um, paper, um, star quilt and ha and wrote poems um, and inspired by the um, interviews that we um, conducted. And so she created this piece um, and then created a second piece that I'll show you, which was um, is found poetry from Zint Kalasha, who is a writer. Um, a Lakota writer in the late 1800s. Um, and so I, and this, the idea with these poems is to start in the middle where the buffaloes are um, on this image and kind of work your way out um, from the diamond with the first word all the way to out to the outer diamond. So um, I the next slide I'll show you, um, this one is called obligation. This, piece is called Obligations, and I'll read one of the diamonds um, just to give you a sense of how um, the poems can be read. So this, again, this is Obligations, and this is um, diamond, the full diamond number six. Um, so this first um, sentence, as we, is the middle um, is the middle diamond by the buffalo, um, and then you work your way out. So it, it could be read like this. Um, as we reach out, mindful of forgetfulness, we shift our anger into a cadence vibrating the cellular. As we reach out in the presence of trust, we face our anger into cadence vibrating the cellular. As we retaliate in the presence of betrayal, we cry our anger into an echo 
uncaging the cellular. So Laylee would um, hope and um, understanding of how she put this together is that you could read this poem in any um, direction really starting with as we and ending with the cellular. So you could go in any um, combination of the kind of creating your own poetry, um, giving you some autonomy of her of her words. Um, and then the next poem she did um, three our piece, star quilt piece was this um, this one here called Mosquitoes. <laughs> And it is um, found poetry from Zink Kalasha. Um, and so again, you start in the center um, or this middle diamond with the first words on it and then um, move your way out. And so here it is in just a paper form um, to be able. And again, so you would start with, we require and then move your way down to um, glare down upon her. Um, so here's an image of the two quilts next to each other. So the, um, I'm gonna stop this <laughs> video here. So you can go to um, Racing Magpie's website and um, find the exhibit, Madaki Oyasane. Um, but I, I don't wanna play this video just cause it's hard to hear, but um, if you go to our website, Racing Magpie um, slash Madaki Oyasane exhibit, um, you can watch this video. And it um, kind of gives you the sense of, cause all of the pieces are speaking, um, and so there's kind of this conversation that is happening between all of the um, parts of the exhibition. Um, and it can get uncomfortable for some folks and um, others. Um, it's almost comforting to be there to hear these Lakota women explaining what Madaki Oyasin um, means. And, you know, in the through this whole process, um, we came to the understanding as a group, um, the three of us, was that um, Madakyo Oyasin is more or less a, a prayer. And that when you say it, um, you're saying I'm responsible for you as my relative <laughs> and I have obligations to you. And not just your human to human um, relatives, but to your non-human relatives as well. You have a responsibility to your land, to the land, not your land, to land, um, to mosquitoes, <laughs> to the air, you know. Um, and that's so when you say that phrase and when you use it, um, it shouldn't, it's a prayer that you're saying and doing. That's the understanding that we came to after um, with this exhibition. Um, so, and I think that's all. Thank you for listening to me. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. That was great. Um, next, we have Sophie Durbin, she, her pronouns, who will be presenting educational experiences for the public. Thank you so much to everyone who's already spoken. Uh, clearly, we have so much to talk about tonight, and I'm really honored to participate. So thank you for listening. Um, my name is Sophie Durbin. I'm a curator and multidisciplinary artist. I manage a small multi-purpose art space in South Minneapolis called Pancake House, which has hosted experimental programs for the community since 2018. So here you can see two pictures of the space. 
One is our exterior storefront on the left, and on the right is a scene from our opening in 2018, which was a community science fair. Um, as you can see, the space is a typical white cube, very small, with a capacity of maybe 30 people tops. And our size, as well as our deep interest in the area immediately surrounding us, um, and also just being involved in more cross-disciplinary programming, has led us to extend ourselves outside the white cube and into the public arena over the past few years. And I'll be giving you a few examples of that today. So why step outside the storefront? So for one thing, from the beginning, the space has had no budget or a very low budget. We've also had a small but enthusiastic public following. And we've also obviously had some spatial limitations given how tiny our storefront is. Um, wanting to engage with the public as much as possible while also maintaining a spirit of experimentation has led us to host a number of programs outside in the community area. And our goal in, within this is always to encourage a sense of awe in the ordinary. So Pancake House is within the Standish Erickson neighborhood in South Minneapolis, not far from Minnehaha Falls, um, Lake Nokomis, Lake Hiawatha. Um, you can see here a few local businesses that are nearby. We have many residential areas as well. And all of these places, while some of them are obvious examples of natural beauty and some of them are just sort of um, commercial spaces are things that we find inspiration in when we're designing our programming. So one pro program that we hosted was called the Radial Residency Project. So in this project, Miriam Carricker and Cole Poliche, who were performing as moat on viola and saxophone, they selected three sites within a one mile radius of our storefront. And they performed at each one, each at a different time of day throughout the summer of 2019. Um, performances were attended by both those who planned to go and also those who became accidental audience members because these were public spaces. As you can see, Moat played with temporality as well as place by varying their performance times. So how does the light affect the performance? How does the environment produce different audiences and how do they interact with the surroundings? For example, on the tennis court, people roamed around and there were even kids playing a game with one of the tennis balls. Under the bridge, people were stationary and because it was such a narrow space and bikes were whizzing by, it was a combined pedestrian bike area. Um, people were kind of wedging themselves against the gate to um, avoid bikers. And then on the beach, people sat in chairs watching the sunset like it was a film. Shifting focus from the natural world to the built world, another way that we've played with place as a medium was through walking tours to supposedly mundane locations. And I'd actually like to give a shout out to Ellen's Walking as Artistic Practice course at MCAD Continuing Education, which I took last summer and where I learned about Dadaist tours of boring places. And then I me immediately had to create my own and invite people to participate in them. By honing in on these specific businesses, we found moments of surprising poignancy. Um, so as you can see, one of the tours was to Burger King on the 46th and Hiawatha in Minneapolis. And it was co-hosted by um, Deep Fried, which is a zine, and I believe the only zine, that is about fast food. And Allison, who is one of the editors of the zine, she read a letter aloud as we were all sharing a pile of fries um, from a Deep Fried subscriber who wrote a letter about fast food from prison, um, describing in luxurious detail all the fast food he planned to eat the day he's released. So even though this tour originated as a way to engage with a supposedly ordinary location, it actually produced this moment where we all realized that while something like Burger King might seem every day, it's not every day to everyone, certainly not someone who's incarcerated, and it's also not neutral. 
Um, on the right, you can see that another minor autumn excursion that we had was a tour to two local bakeries. Um, both of them were within a walking distance from Pancake House. It was a cold November morning, and I had created an audio guide as well to go along with the tour to kind of guide people. Um, but the interesting thing about both of these tours was they were also really enacted by the people that took them. So while Pancake House designed the framework, um, you could say that the participants were both the audience and the artists, which I think is something that happens within place-based programming no matter what. So then another recent program that we had, and this one actually did take place within our storefronts, but it was very specifically about place in a way that continues the thread of the other programs that I just discussed. Um, so we actually had a panel with three contributors from the Twin Cities who had written articles within Belt Publishing who do, they do really good work about the Midwest and publish uh, books and anthologies about the Midwest as well as um, some, some Appalachia. Um, they created a book called Midwest Architecture Journeys and we had each author present at the space talking about three interesting but very different places within the Twin Cities. So one was Christchurch Lutheran, which I wrote about um, is a modernist church from 1949. Um, also the Purcell Cuts House, which is a um, important prairie style home near Lake of the Isles. And then finally subterranean architecture within the Twin Cities that became very popular um, in the 70s and 80s. So again, while this took place within the storefront and we crammed people in there, um, it was still dedicated to place in a way that these other programs had been. And then after this panel, all kinds of things happened in the world. So a global pandemic broke out, of course, and Minneapolis became the epicenter of a global activist movement demanding racial justice and an end to the police as we know it. Um, all of these worldwide, worldwide events have been a reason to reflect on place-based programming at Pancake House and everywhere else. So for example, how might these outdoor activities serve as models for safely socially distanced in-person programs when the time is right, given that we'll likely be unable to gather in our storefront for a, a long time? What does it mean that right next to the Burger King where we went on a irreverent tour, the holiday gas station actually did burn to the ground after the murder of George Floyd when the city was um, absolutely undergoing a, a time of righteous anger. The radial residency performance all took place on Minneapolis Parks and Recreation land, which is now the center of community conversation about sanctuary for unhoused people. So while we might have framed these places as mundane and originally thought of them as a way to encourage people to find awe in the ordinary, it's important to remember that they were certainly never neutral and they continue not to be. And that's where I'll leave you. I took the original 10-minute uh, um, guideline very seriously, and I think I might even be closing out below that. Who knows? But I'm happy to talk more about what we've done at Pancake House, any ideas people might have or questions they have um, today or otherwise. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was fantastic. And thank you, too, for the shout out for the walking class. That is a favorite activity for me every summer, and I'm looking forward to it this summer as well. Um, next, we have Glenna Jennings, she, her pronouns, who will be presenting Dinner in the Desert Kitchen. Hello. I'm trying to make sure that you are seeing my correct screen here in just one moment. All right. And I, I also tried to stick with the original 10 minutes, but I may not be uh, as faithful as our last amazing presentation there, but I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, I'm gonna talk about Dinner in the Desert Kitchen, Art, Education, and Food Justice by introducing Dayton, Ohio, talking a bit about food deserts, 
uh, discussing our community partner, Gem City Market, and then the experiential learning projects of Desert Kitchen Collective, a place-based entity. So uh, we have the distinction of being featured as Fretline's first city in Left Behind America, debuting September 11th, 2018. Um, so this, this show presented, quote, intimate stories of one Rust Belt city struggle to recover in the post-recession economy of Dayton, Ohio, a once booming city where nearly 35% of people now live in poverty, unquote. So like many Rust Belt cities, Dayton has experienced decades of industrial pullout and disinvestment and also bears the troubling distinction of being the 15th most segregated city in the USA as of 2017. Um, that said, we have a thriving community of activists, civic leaders, educators, and humans striving to change these facts. So here we are in downtown Dayton on uh, May 30th, a date when many of us here may have been preparing in that other pre-COVID world to uh, visit Minneapolis. And instead, like many across the nation, we were protesting a murder that took place in that epicenter. Um, so here on our public streets, I share these posts. And I share one from our mayor, Nan Whaley, partly because my students uh, are responsible for taking this profile picture that she chose to use recently um, and was taken right before the pandemic for a different project. And I share that just to show that there's a small town feeling to our city. So whatever you may feel about our local uh, politicians and city leaders, we have access to them. And, and that was a big change for me um, coming from Los Angeles in 2011 to the city I now consider home in Dayton. And, and I came here in 2011, and that year Dayton was also found to be the fourth most food insecure city in the nation. And since I had just come from a real geographic desert in Southern California, I actually grew up in a, a rural area that was a desert, uh, I really had no clue about food deserts, which I quickly learned are uh, areas where residents access to healthy food options, mainly fresh produce, is restricted um, to the absence of healthy grocery stores within a convenient traveling distance. And in recent years, many of my colleagues have instead adopted the term food apartheid because this much better emphasizes the uh, non-natural systemic causes of food insecurity which include racism, cost of living, transportation, access to culturally appropriate foods and more. But for the purposes of our project, we've really stuck with desert. I feel it's uh, a term rich with metaphorical meaning and, and it aids in the teaching of place as well. And by the way, if you visit uh, feedingamerica.org, you can type in your own city or county and an interactive map like this will provide statistics on food insecurity. So there are pockets of hunger in basically all cities and counties across the nation. Um, since 2011, though, uh, when we were number four, we have moved down that list to number 42 in, in the subsequent years. And I would say that's largely uh, thanks to the work of our community partners in food justice that, that you see here. Um, and I do want to share that we also work with organizations that assist uh, immigrants and refugees in our area, uh, but I'm really trying to focus mostly on food justice and specifically on our community partner, Gem City Market. So uh, here you see a, a page from a student publication that has not yet actually been published thanks to COVID, uh, but it provides facts about Gem City Market, which is a member-owned, full-service grocery store at cooperative set to open in January 2021, um, based on a model that really serves to, um, serves to resist, tries to resist gentrification. It's a completely grassroots organized entity and uh, has been able to raise upwards of $4 million in the past four years. Uh, the site of the future markets in a current food desert in a majority African-American neighborhood where I also happen to live. Uh, here are some further uh, student photos of this and other community events that took place in the last two years. Um, as our, our board president, Amaha Selassie, likes to say, Gem City is not just a market, but a movement. 
And it, it really has provided a wonderful model, a really cross-disciplinary model through which to engage students with experiential learning opportunities around food justice. So what does that look like? Um, I'll take us back here to 2014, the time before the market existed. I had just begun teaching the first class on art and social practice at my historically white university, which is the University of Dayton. Uh, I partnered with a friend and colleague from sociology at that time, Dr. Ruth Thompson Miller, who you can see here in this slide. Um, her focus is critical race theory and research. And we chose food really as a means through which to address issues of race and uh, social inequity. Our first cohort consisted of four young women, most of whom you see in this photograph at the bottom here, and the two of us. I, I guarantee you that something like that will not happen again for a very long time, thanks to budget cuts that started happening even before uh, COVID. So it was a really fortuitous situation and it allowed us to develop a, an intimate rapport in this group. Um, and we really didn't quite know what we were doing yet, but we, we conducted a lot of preliminary field research, interviewing uh, folks in affected areas, um, participating in, in uh, deep discussion and case studies around food. And so here you see a couple artifacts that the students produced, uh, some napkins with uh, statistics, the cover of a zine that contains photo photography and research, and a little interactive situation taking place at an arts related event in a fancy downtown area removed from the sites of vulnerability. So again, uh, that was 2014 preliminary research into how to use food to talk about race and other issues. But what is our process? Uh, since that time, we've come to use socially engaged art as a foundation to work across multiple disciplines. As I mentioned, there's sociology, but I've also worked with um, professors from anthropology, from political science, from sustainability and natural sciences. It's a project-based experiential learning. So that means it's student-centered, it's solution-driven, collaborative field research, uh, art production and reflection. But when I say solution-driven, that's coming from an artist. So um, it's, it's also really idea-driven and, and we create experiences as well as solutions. Uh, and our, our solutions may not come to fruition, but they do generate discussion. So again, it's community-based. Coming from a, a, a Catholic institution, and I, I'm wary of, of terms like service learning and certain service learning that's taken place in the past with a, a white savior sort of uh, idea. We're trying to move away from that. We connect with community partners to try to develop trust and, and long-term sustainable relationships over time. It's uh, transdisciplinary in the sense that we have a lot of campus partners, but then moving from the campus into the community is what I how I kind of define trans uh, versus uh, cross-disciplinary working. And really it's about thinking critically, creatively, and inclusively with others. At the bottom here, you see the, the logo that we still use created by a graphic design student in our very first cohort, riffing off of Andy Warhol, also referencing the problematic uh, nature of the non-perishable canned donation. So that brings us to uh, two years in the future. We finally got together a cohort, a larger group of students, about 16 students collaborating with another class of about 16 students. And they produced the first dinner experience back in, in a, a white a cube, like Sophie was talking about, that we luckily had uh, funding and uh, the institution, our department really has a small space off campus. So um, we invited uh, guests from a cross section of Dayton and those guests sat in the middle of a small gallery space whose capacity is around, it's less than 100 and the dinner serves about uh, 20. They're surrounded by installation pieces about food production and food insecurity. Um, they were then served over the period of, of an hour, either high-end food from an expensive local grocery store uh, a middle class sort of pasta meal provided by university dining services, or if you weren't as lucky, a frozen meal straight out of a container. Um, the students served these meals to the guests. 
So this was loosely based on poverty simulation exercises, but there was not really a role playing um, element. The invited guests simply had to deal with the literal card they were dealt upon arrival to reinforce the notion that poverty is not a choice. Um, the event is free and open to the public, so there's also kind of a purposeful tension between the special guests and the general audience. So towards the end of the evening, we then bring out, and this is what you see students doing right here, uh, a supply of plentiful food. In this case, it was all from a local immigrant-owned uh, taqueria mixteca, and they donated all of that food for free. This is significant because the uh, high-end grocery store I mentioned and Kroger both declined to provide donations or discounts for our event that year. They said it was just a bad time of the year. And I find that interesting because we always host this two weeks before Christmas. So this first event, event really helped instill an important part of our ongoing work, which is to celebrate the contributions of our, our local immigrant community um, especially around food. So in this slide, you also see some items that have become integral to the annual event and the kinds of experiential learning the students get. There's always a poster and some social media materials that are produced by a team, usually of graphic design majors. Um, there are small edition photographs um, produced by students from many different majors, and largely my colleague Julie Jones, digital process students, also contribute to this. Uh, you see some plates here, which are designed by the students and then produced with the help of a ceramics professor, and his class um, participates in the firing and painting of those plates. In the background, you see some student-designed wallpaper that, if we could look closely, has uh, details, uh, information, statistics about food insecurity. So the rest of the projects hang on that wallpaper, providing a kind of uh, homey and domestic feel. And these small additions are, are given as gifts or in exchange uh, for, for money or um, non-perishable food items. And all of that goes directly to our community partners. Here you can see uh, a little closer view of our first round of plates. They've really gotten a lot more sophisticated since then, but I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not sharing all the plates. But you can see on the right two are guests entering next to pieces that were available for silent auction. So over the years, we've, we've managed to raise, um, you know, about, about $1,000 a year that we are able to give directly to, uh, at that time, the food bank, and now directly to Gem City Market. So moving ahead to 2018, I'm skipping a, an event for sake of time. And that year we focused on issues around immigration, worked with uh, Welcome Dayton, a local organization that provides assistance to immigrants and refugees. And I worked specifically with an organization that I'm on the board of, Latinos Unidos, and we created a menu in conjunction with a number of local Latin American owned food businesses from Mexico, Bolivia, and, and beyond. Um, one of our partners, Manuel Beliz, is on here making pupusas. Um, our university president, Eric Spina, is uh, browsing one of our student publications in front of the auction work for that year. And again, you see folks participating in the dinner experience on the design plates. And that is also, uh, there's interactive conversation and themes and, and goals and activities during the dinner. Uh, finally, this past December, uh, not long before our, our world changed, uh, we presented an event that was based around redlining. And uh, this was the most recent and largest of our events, which also partnered with a sustainability class called Constructions of Place which has a lot of engineers in that class. Um, so I, I'm not gonna get into all the moving parts. And essentially there's always a lot of moving parts in these events, which I'm able to do because I'm always working with other professors and an array of students. But you can see our poster was designed based on uh, historic redlining maps from our city and a number of other cities. And our theme was also no space like home which I now see was quite um, fortuitous <laughs> with what was looming ahead. I just have a couple more slides. This presents uh, the student publication pages from the work in progress that we were doing to be put out in April. 
But now we are working to, for spring 2021 so that we can reach out not only to University of Dayton students, but also classes in art and sociology at our uh, Sinclair Community College in order to provide more writing and artwork that reflects on food justice during both the pandemic and the uh, civil rights movement that has emerged. And finally, I share these also pages from the upcoming uh, student publication. These are the last photographs that were produced in the final weeks before COVID sent us home. They show Amaha Selassie and Kenya Baker, two community organizers and educators who shared their stories for this publication and with whom um, I've continued to work on local initi initiatives even during the pandemic. And certain students have also had the opportunity to volunteer or to do internships during this pandemic, continuing to work on food justice and branch out into to other issues of systemic injustice and systemic interest in the community. Um, so I'll conclude by saying that in 2021, I'll be sharing this uh, print and digital publication with these new friends and colleagues from MCAD. And I end here with a huge thank you uh, for inviting me and my city to the screen today. There's uh, the website for Desert Kitchen Collective and my own email there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Glenna. That was fantastic. Um, next up, we have Alex Buffalohead, Dakota she, her pronouns, who will be presenting curating in mini Shota Makoche. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Ellen, for that introduction and for organizing and inviting me to present as one of the panelists. I am so honored to be speaking with you all this evening, along with these other well-respected co-panelists. Uh, my name is Alex. Oh, here, I'm going to hide this. I don't know if you can see that. There we go. My name is Alex Buffelhead. I'm Betawakatan Dakota, citizen of Sisseton Wakatan Oyate tribe. And I live in Minneapolis right now and I use she, her pronouns. I will be sharing my perspective as a curator working with First Nations artists and as a guest curator at High Point Center for Printmakers in Minneapolis and Artistry in Bloomington, Minnesota. Um, in addition, I will be sharing how place plays a role in my curatorial practice. So um, I'm just wondering if, um, if Seth, if you could pull up my first poll. I'm gonna try and break this up a little bit and let you guys interact. Um, I'm wondering if you guys could share if you've worked with, there it is, if you've hired work with or contract with Indigenous First Nations artists, curators. And the poll is still in progress. So I might only do one or two of these polls, just since it's, we're heading towards 7.30 and to be respected full of everyone else's time. All right, so 50 said 52% said yes and 48% said no. And I'm not sure where my presentation went. Hmm. I wonder if Seth, can you make Alex the presenter again? Yes, um, they are still the presenter. Hmm. I'm not sure where my presentation went. Hold on. Just bear with us for a second, folks. Sorry, people. 
No worries. Take your time, Alex. I, I'll take this moment while we're finding the presentation again, just to remind folks that if, as you've been listening, if you've had any really great questions that you'd like me to ask the presenters um, after we're done here, go ahead and type them into that question box. And um, as we've been going along here, I've been taking notes on areas where I see overlap or commonalities and where we might even ask some of our presenters to talk to one another about a topic. Um, but really, those are backups. I'd love to, I would really enjoy sharing um, your questions for them. All right, thank you, Owen. Does it look like, am I sharing right now? I think Seth needs to make you the presenter again. Okay. Yes, you, you are still the presenter. So if you want to go ahead and look at the drop down where it says sharing, and mm -hmm. then click show on the play button. Thank you. There we go. Sorry, y'all. No worries, okay. it's there. <laughs> All right, so um, with my experience growing up in the Twin Cities and visiting my relatives in Bandu, South Dakota and other Dakota reservations, um, dancing at different Wachipis, powwows at Prairie Island and Lower Sioux and Shakopee, um, I was told and reminded by my family that we're living on the same land of my relatives and my ancestors. So I, I'm frequently reminded and think of place where I live in kind of my everyday um, experience. And so I've also, um, questioned while growing up why I didn't see um, kind of structural spaces in the Twin Cities representing um, myself, my family, or the shared multi-perspective of history and how much that it became a state. Um, a few exceptions have been places like the Minneapolis American Indian Center and All My Relations Arts Gallery and Two Rivers Gallery. Um, and so I just like to mention that even for the image used in the Teaching Place Conference is a sacred site for Dakota people, um, also known as the Stone Arch Bridge. Um, this is a place um, known by the Dakota. One name is Owamini Omini Whirlpool and has a history before it was physically changed to create um, space for industries of transporting barges and mill industries, as well as being a trading space for the Dakota and Anishinaabe people, Ho-Chunk, who also have names for this place. Um, so there was actually an island um, called Spirit Island, which the limestone was physically removed in the 1960s by the US Army Corps of Engineers. And the limestone was quarried by settlers and today is believed to be currently in some of the nearby buildings in Minneapolis, such as the Stone Arch and the Pillsbury Amel. Um, this image is a still from the video, The Uncompromising Hand by Andrea Carlson, who through her um, illumination project with illuminating Lock and Dam with Northern Lights, brought attention of the erasure of this place that um, by destroying the sacred island and renaming indigenous places is a tactic used of erasure. Uh, so with these histories of forced assimilation and genocide and forced removal and exile, um, in Minnesota, I have been thinking, how do I support artists who are sharing these stories and support their narratives um, and create spaces for them to tell their stories? And so I had the opportunity to create a group exhibition at High Point Center for Printmakers in Minneapolis in partnership with the Native Art Studies Association Conference back in October of 2019. And so I just, I attempted to be as inclusive as I could of as many Native um, printmakers who had connections to Minnesota as I was able to. And so I questioned um, by incorporating space, um, how to incorporate diversity of native nations um, from here or who are living here, as well as being conscious of gender balance and artist career levels. And so the name of the show was kind of gifted and in collaboration with my grandpa Dale Weston and explaining to me that the meaning of the state um, named Minnesota, Mini Shota Makoche, where the waters reflect the sky, and how it, it's not just this definition, but it's the um, the experience of when you see the clouds reflected in the water. And so I was also fortunate um, to work with Angel Two Stars, who's my current colleague at All My Relations in NACTI, and um, I was able to work with her in creating another part of the exhibition title. And she's a printmaker and shared that. Um, there's kind of this knowledge transference that happens as a printmaker when they're learning um, just the different techniques and the processes and how it's similar to how cultural knowledge is exchanged and passed down 
um, through language and generations. And so, um, yeah, in my um, curatorial process, um, I also wanted to try and show the diverse and complex subjects and themes that all these different artists use um, in really in referencing to sovereignty, treaty rights with land, revitalizing language, the generational transference of knowledge, um, the iconography of place in the work, and that this also inspired my second curatorial experience. Um, so I'm gonna skip through this. Um, so I was really honored to be one of the 2019 Emerging Curators Institute Fellows, and in my original proposal, I wanted I considered how do I create a space in working collaboration with um, Native artists where they feel safe, their friends, their families feel comfortable and see themselves reflected in an appropriate, respectful way. Um, and so artistry in Bloomington Center for the, for the Arts um, was one of the options and I agreed to work with them. And it's located near the Mississippi and Minnesota River and near Pilot Knob where the 1851 Treaty of Mendota um, was signed. And um, this building is connected to their city hall. So there's kind of this bureaucratic sense um, to the space as well. And so to my knowledge, um, the exhibition I curated was the second um, ever curated exhibition of native artists by an indigenous curator, Gianni Whitehawk, um, who was presenting at this conference on Friday curated this all-female identifying natives, native art exhibition in 2016, which was only four years ago. Um, and even four years ago, Gianni was saying, and quote, we're still trying to have our voices heard. We're not as visible and not as readily seen in, in those places. And so I'd just like to share a little geographical history um, of where artistry is located. Um, it's near Mendota, where the signing of the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, the Dakota transference of ownership of the land to the United States, which led to the Dakota War of 1862. And the United States um, were violating their treaties by having late payments causing and um, leading starvation to the Dakota people and hardship um, leading to the uprising. And then um, to President Lincoln giving orders of the mass execution hanging of the 38 plus two on December 26 in 1862, which is um, still to this day the largest mass execution in United States history. Um, and then the rest of the Dakota people were exiled out of Minnesota to Nebraska, South Dakota, um, Canada, and even Ho-Chunk people that were living near Mankato were forced to leave Minnesota as well. And so with this kind of heavy history, I wanted to focus on kind of the resilience of the Dakota people um, and indigenous people by working with artists that are from here and from exiled communities, as well as um, asking and inviting the artists if they would share works that they're comfortable with that they felt was revitalizing symbols in their cultures and through their languages, as in, and as well as in relation to the land that they're um, living with and connected to and as well as symbols. Um, and so not only by inviting artists from this region, but um, from other regions of Indian country to show the complexity of all the different perspectives of these, that these artists have. Um, Minnesota, there's four Dakota tribes and seven Ojibwe and 50 plus, I think maybe 57 others that are living um, and going to school, um, I think pre pre-K through 12th grade um, in the Twin Cities. And so um, this was, a, I mean, something that I challenged with, and Mary um, Bordeaux kind of mentioned this, but trying not to make this seem like it was pan-Indianism. Um, and as a way to kind of combat this is by showing, um, having the artists write their artist labels and showing um, the nations that they come from in the text. Um, and so, I was really fortunate that this exhibition was done during a cohort. Um, it was kind of the first cohort um, through Emerging Curators Institute and working with their staff and guest speakers that they brought in for the program across the country. And um, I was fortunate to have access to a mentor, Michelle Westmark Wingard, and worked closely with um, gallery director Rachel Daly and this is really a helpful reciprocal learning experience, I feel like for me and for um, Rachel at the gallery, um, who um, listened to my concerned, uh, concerns as they 
maybe arose and took action, making sure that the artists were paid um, as what we were able to give them um, and that the funding that the, the artists were given and for the exhibition wasn't sponsored by a corporate sponsor, for example, not working or using grants that come from Wells Fargo, who was one of the supporters of the now stop Dakota Access Pipeline at Scanning Rock. And so um, for this exhibition, it's also important to work with artists uh, who are working in different mediums, um, like Holly with her ledger artwork, she's also known Peter and um, Jada Great Eagle, um, who did a photography and audio documentation series of women from the Ochechi Shakoween Seven Council Friends, um, who the women determined the, the women in the photographs determined and controlled um, their own photographic gaze, which challenges the European past canonization of Native art and photography. And so it was really important just to work with, um, I know this is a small sample of many different artists working in different mediums, but it was um, an attempt to kind of alleviate stereotypes and create space for artists to show their work and for them to control the narrative of the work. Um, and I hope um, to continue this work and support others by creating space and continue to increase visibility of Native and Dakota artists. Um, and I don't know if I have time to do one. I'm scared to do another poll, so I will just end this. Um, <laughs> so, I just want to thank you all and would, would encourage everyone to visit and support and hire Native artists and curators and galleries. Um, when things are safe, please come visit us at All My Relations Arts and check out Racing Magpie, um, the organization that Mary Bordeaux mentioned earlier. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alex. That was really great. Um, and last but not least, um, next we have Javier Tavera, he, him pronouns, who will be presenting Symbols and Historical Representations of Oppression. Hi, everybody. Thanks for um, hanging in there. I'll promise I'll keep it under uh, 10 minutes. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, symbols and historical representations of operations. Um, as an immigrant and an image maker, I have always paid attention to symbols and representation. Amongst the historical ones, are, uh, there are around 1,712 Confederate monuments standing in the U.S. At the time when these monuments were installed, they were not seen as memories about the past. They were rather considered to be symbols for the present time. The history and purpose of erecting monuments more than educate, they have been put in place to intimidate. They have been making a point everywhere, uh, everywhere I travel, to visit these monuments. As a small gesture of irreverence, I take a picture as a simple act of resistance and opposition toward these celebrations. These simple acts are not intended to change history. I believe that we shouldn't forget characters and events, but we can certain, certainly change to a more positive narrative. This image I took in Mexico City uh, in last December, and uh, for the longest time, the Mexican people have tried to uh, bring down this uh, monument of Columbus. This image that I took um, inside the Robert E. Lee Chapel in Lexington, Virginia. This image I took in San Diego, uh, this is how it looks after the removal of a Confederate plaque in Horton Plaza. Throughout history, we have monumentalized ideas of injustice, colonization, violence, war, racism, and their perpetrators. There is a human need to idealize and venerate beliefs and persons. History is not an absolute truth. It can be documented in various mediums and in different ways. As societies tend to evolve, we question those mediums and its commemoration. 
we challenge the endurance of ideas, characters, causes, and their display. But what does the, the but what does these symbols really do? Besides from the discussion of history and times gone by and forgetting, the places where these artifacts exist, government buildings, square, parks, universities and museums, act as places of exclusion, white places where other people might feel unwelcome. In June 10, 2020, I arrived at the monument at the moment that the native protesters have removed the Christopher Columbus statue from the Capitol. The statue was being retrieved and escorted out of the Capitol grounds by what it looked at the time as a police funeral escort. While the figure was carried out in a truck, drums and singing disrupted the funeral silence and people occupied the now empty pedestal. It was quite a moving scene. In my research, I tried to draw similarities in time and history. The Minnesota History Center has fragments of rope from different historical events. This one is a fragment of execution rope used in February 13, 1906, in the hanging death of William Williams in St. Paul. Williams was the last execution to take place in Minnesota. The death penalty was removed from state criminal law in 1911. Fragments of the rope used in the hanging of the 38 Dakota prison prisoners is in possession of the History Center. This is a fragment of the rope used by Native women to bring down the Columbus statue in St. Paul, Minnesota. I believe that this fragment is also a piece of Minnesota history. Monuments, statues, and other edifices have been erected around the world to commemorate, commemorate character, characters and causes. In contemporary times, we're taking into consideration how symbols might have different meanings for different audiences. The list of hit symbols is enormous. Allow me to show some of the photographs that I have taken of domestic and local artifacts in Minnesota. This one is of Luke Erickson, considered as the plaque there shows, the discoverer of America, when native populations already existed here. This one is for Charles Lindbergh, recognized as an American aviator, who actually professed deep hatred of Jews and non-wise, and it was a Nazi sympathizer. There's also um, north of St. Cloud, uh, the house of Char Charles Lindbergh, and uh, that is uh, also a state park. This one is the prisoner, the pioneer statue at Boom Island in Northeast Minneapolis, erected in 1936. This is the back of it, and recently cleaned up because it was vandalized. You can see some of the red in uh, the priest's hands and face. And you can see, see also how depicted a uh, native person in a very submissive position. Now, my curiosity and attention has been drawn to symbols in everyday life. Billboards, hats, graffiti, and symbols in cars and houses. This is a billboard north of St. Cloud, and I want you to pay attention about the conspiracy legend right on, uh, on, on the last line. This is in, inside of a home in Stillwater, Minnesota. This was also in the inside of a home, in, the, in, in a Stillwater, Minnesota home. So uh, what does it mean to wear items like this? In these times, it's not possible to argue that the item only represents the support of a political figure. It is 
a declaration of identity. And knowing that implies that you're okay with provocation. The hat has been weaponized by the white supremacist and a symbol with dark connotations. These images were taken uh, last November uh, in a peaceful protest when a, a, a rally outside the Target um, a stadium. Uh, we tried to be peacefully, but um, even with these raptors, it was quite complicated. This is uh, graffiti in North Minneapolis. And uh, pay attention on the conversation between the garage and the car. This I took two days ago. Uh, it's a blue strap flag in Crookston, Minnesota. Um, this is about a quarter of a mile where Latino students of mine uh, pasted some posters of uh, Black Lives Matter. Currently, as we speak, we are erecting one of the biggest and longest monuments in the nation. I'm talking about the wall at the southern, southern border between Mexico and US. This is a monument to hate, displacement, and intolerance. It screams with its muted voice, keep out, stay away, you don't belong, you will never belong. With its presence, other artifacts supplement its existence. But I'm very happy that we are lucky that there always be other voices. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javier. That was great. And I realize we're, we've are we got about 10 minutes here um, before we're done. And I just want to jump right into um, Q&A. I've got a good question from Jojen Van Winkle here asking, um, is it possible to discuss place without social or political connections embedded in the conversation? Why or why not? And I, I'd be really curious to hear what folks have to say about that. Um, so I wonder if our panelists would mind turning on their cameras and their microphones so that um, we can hear from you. There we go, I've got Javier. There, there we go, everybody's coming. And if that sparks um, thought or reflection from any of you, feel free to jump right in on that. Is this question typed in the chat? Yes, yeah, it's in the questions box. Um, it's the very last one, or second to last one at 7.50 p.m. Oh, and there's another long one right after that. So feel free to check out both those two questions there. One's from Jojen and one's from Alexis. The second one from Alexis is acknowledging with respect to the native peoples of Kickapoo, Osage, Miami, and Sioux, St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you all for your talks. Given that we all have experienced shifting relationship to place, having mostly occupied our homes for periods of time during the pandemic, have you all considered how your practice engages with your particular place thematic investigations through virtual means, especially since there has been a commonality of engaging place communally? How is this changing your investigations with place? And I know some of you are coming at this as individual artists, others as curators, others as educators. Feel free to answer from your own point of view. Well, um, let, let me start. Um, my Most of my practice is documentary um, photography. And uh, I, I think probably 97% of the images that I do are portraits. And now it has become very difficult uh, from four months to now. So I have shifted that in making objects uh, and also photographing objects. It feels a little exhausting for me not have uh, not to have a, a direct contact with people and the people that I photograph. But um, that's uh, one of the shifts that I have made. And I'm dealing with the same uh, themes that I have 
in my documentary process. And it's about displacement and, and identity and whatnot. Thank you, Javier. Anyone else want to jump in on there? I think another possible prompt here is as I was listening to all of these presentations, I started to hear overlap um, from monuments to curation, the ordinary, the everyday, um, uh, the idea of simply teaching in general. I, I wanted to acknowledge, Alex, thank you for teaching us about the image that was selected for the conference. That was really powerful. Um, narratives. Uh, I don't know if any of these keywords are, are, you know, bringing forth commentary that you'd like to highlight. The weaponization of objects. If anybody wants to speak to any of those. No. I can um, talk a little bit about uh, the weaponizing of objects um, since I I brought it up, and I'm I'm like hyper aware now of objects, objects and sounds. Uh, I live in South Minneapolis, uh, a few blocks from where George Floyd was murdered. And we are alert all the time uh, from different uh, outside license plates to bumper stickers, to hats, to what uh, printed material on on t-shirts and um, what what does that mean? Uh, how do they display the identity of the one that is driving it or wearing it? Uh, it is it has been it has it has always been there, but now that sensitivity is hyper, and we are completely aware all the time at all times uh, on what those elements are around us. Absolutely. I wonder if anybody else here, um, I know Glenna, you're coming from outside um, and similarly, Mary, you're in South Dakota right now, but I, I wonder if anyone else has reflections on that hyper awareness uh, in, in Minneapolis right now. I don't know. Um, oh. Go for it, Mary. Okay. So I just, um, I was just thinking that um, I think as a, as a woman um, and as a Lakota woman growing up in South Dakota, that we already had that hyper awareness <clears throat> of um, what, how, um, like the vehicles people drive, um, especially working, um, growing up on the reservation and being in border towns. Um, and the um, where where stores you stop at, um, who you interact with, and how you interact with them. Um, I think it was is it something that we, or I have experienced as a Lakota woman growing up on the reservation, going to especially border towns, um, the towns that are right outside our reservation borders. Um, it's similar to what Javier was just um, explaining, and what's probably been happening in Minneapolis. So. Thank you for that, Mary. Yeah. With just a, a minute or two left, I want to leave space to if anyone just has some general comments or observations. And if not, we won't force it. <laughs> to, well, you to know, I, yeah, you oh, know, go. I have to say that I just I've been really impressed with the presentations and and Ellen, like you mentioned, the kind of the the interconnectedness um, of this. And I think um, oftentimes, um, you know, what you see from these presentations is the world is an incredibly asymmetric and sticky place. Um, and so much of our time is spent by the state trying to organize or trying to go ahead and categorize or trying to identify and and through that and i think trying to control uh kind of um uh the substance so it's it's uh when you are moving between the spheres of photography and curatorial practice and education and making um i think the conversations 
are complex. And uh, I think maybe I could be wrong, but what flummoxed me about the earlier question about space is um, space is relative. It's relative to an individual's experience. It's relative um, to where you are in that moment in time. It's not a, a codified principle that was written by a French philosopher that everyone is supposed to espouse or endorse. Uh, and so I, I guess I just wanted to say that I just, uh, I'm still thinking about what all my fellow panelists' remarks were uh, about and, and the com complexity and the nuance that is driving behind it. Thank you so much, Sanji. That's a really fantastic um, reflection. Uh, and actually, I'm gonna take advantage of that to uh, respect everybody's time and and close out <laughs> and um, we didn't get far into the the q a but um i before i let you all go do check out our really wonderful crowdsourced reading list um, one of the questions that just rolled in was from billy um, and they asked can you recommend additional resources for learning about work by native american and first nations artists in particular for use in teaching examples um, and if you check out that crowdsourced reading list that's uh, the link is in the handout um, there, we've had some real generosity in that document, and there's some great stuff in there. And I would invite our panelists, if, if you want to visit that and also add to that document, please feel free. Um, I'm really excited about that resource. And this is just day one of the conference, so um, <laughs> there's three more days of really exciting material coming up, and I'm sure these crowdsourced um, resources will continue to grow and, and flourish by the end of the week. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This was really fantastic. Um, have a great evening, and uh, thank you for your presence. Thank you. Thank you.